I'm Nicola Indeed. I've been working at Coal and Coal Products Annual Statistics at the Energy Data Center for some time now. And this responsibility will pass to Sergio later on next cycle. And I'm very happy to guide you through this presentation. We passed yesterday from the gaseous fossil fuel to the liquid ones. And now we are going to look at the solid fossil fuels. So let's start with a review of the sectors. And you will see figures up to 2022. So I must warn you that the 2022 numbers that you see here are the preliminary ones that we produced last cycle. And we are now in the process of consolidating the final 2022 figures and the, pre the new preliminary 2023 in our next publication now in April and uh, in the summer publication. So let's move to show you the importance of coal globally in terms of world total energy supply and also in terms of electricity generation on the right side for 2021. So you see that the two pie charts are a bit different for some products, not so much for coal, which is the second largest energy source on the left side after oil and in front of natural gas in terms of the total energy supply. Whereas in terms of electricity generation is by far, I would say, the most used source for that. Moving on to the coal production, you see here uh, the evolution from 1978. Let me take the laser pointer. I just want to emphasize in the 2000, the steep rise of uh, coal production following the trend of the major producer, which is China. Then in the 2010s, a stagnation and a bit of a volatile trend highlighted here in 2020, uh, a big drop due to the, to the pandemic. And then again, they recover the bounce in 2021 and 2022. So on the right side, you see that China is by far the, the biggest producer, followed by OECD as, um, as an aggregate. So considering all the contribution of the single countries. And then we have India and Indonesia that interestingly, and relatively speaking, are the fastest rising producer in the latest years. In terms of uh, coal consumption, you see that the trend is very, very similar to production. And this obviously makes sense. Although the graph is in different units before we were showing it in physical units, here is in energy units. But you see again that China is by far the biggest consumer of coal, followed by India, and that China and India together compose almost two thirds of the world total uh, consumption. Then USA, the United States are at the, at the third place. And again, you see in 2020 a drop followed by a bounce and a recovery in 2021 and 2022. In terms of uh, trade, looking at exports, OECD, it's now uh, the biggest exporter. Again, we're speaking of the, uh, the aggregate OECD total amount. And this is thanks to Australia mostly, and then also the United States. But if we look at the single states, it's now Indonesia, the big exporter, and it has surpassed um, Australia in the last few years. And I think what is important here to highlight, again, it's that similarly to production and demand, it's a handful of countries that accounts for the vast majority of this flow of exports. In terms of imports, we see OECD being the biggest importer, but China, again, being the biggest single country. So we saw that China was a very big uh, producer of coal, but it's an even bigger consumer. So then it has to import part of its uh, supply. India, it's at the second place, followed by Japan. And it's interesting to see that in our preliminary data, we will see then if they are confirmed or not by the final ones. China and India trend for 2022 was very different with a decrease in China and an increase in India, somehow narrowing the gap between the two, the two countries. And then we have the European Union, which had a big increase. It's the uh, light gray uh, line had a big increase in uh, 2022, especially from Germany, whose uh, imports raised to the pre-pandemic levels. 
Let's move to the key concepts in terms of product classification and uh, code balance. So we now pass to code and code product statistics. And we start with a classification of primary call, which is, as you probably already know, a very heterogeneous product with uh, different physical and uh, chemical characteristics between its different uh, varieties. And this different characteristic also determine its price and its suitability for certain uses. For example, higher carbon content, lower moisture, lower volatile matter means better cooking qualities and in general, better price. On the left side, you see a categorization divided into hard and brown coal. And this is based mostly on the calorific value of uh, the different primary coal. So if primary coal uh, has a calorific value higher than 24,000 kilojoule per kilogram, then it's called hard coal. And we have cooking coal, anthracite, and other bituminous coal entering in this, uh, in this group. And then for brown coal, the calorific value is below 24,000. And we have subbituminous and lignite. Whereas on the right side, you see a classification, common classification, based on the, on the uses, with cooking coal being called metallurgical coal, because it's the one used in iron and steel industry, and then anthracite, especially other bituminous coal and subbituminous coal, which are mostly used in electricity and heat generation, and so they are called steam coal. So until now, I spoke mostly about coal, primary coal, and so on. But in the questionnaire that we collect together with other organizations, we actually get all the solid fossil fuels and also the manufactured gases. So here it's important to distinguish again between primary products. I think that was already said in the introduction to energy statistics, but I want to repeat it here that the primary products are the one that can be harnessed and found in nature. So we have the five ones that we saw before for coal, and there is also peat and oil shell on, uh, on this list on the left side. And then we have the derived products. They can be solid, they can be uh, gaseous in the gaseous form, and they are obtained from the manufacture and transformation of the first one. Very important slide that I will <laughs> let you read later on with, uh, with more calm. So I'm not going to list here all the definition of the products. You have again the division on the left side of the primary products and in the center and in the right, the right side, the one of uh, the derived products. What is important here to highlight the takeaway of this slide is that very often the coal products are interconnected between each other. So knowing this interconnection is very important for validating your data to know whether you have been transmitted the correct data, all the quantities, let's say, involved in the process, but also eventually to estimate missing data gaps. For example, let's quickly look at cooking coal, which is used mostly in cook ovens. We will see that later. And the output are cook oven cook, cook oven gas, and coal tar, generally. And then cook oven cook is used in blast furnaces, and the output is blast furnace gas. So if any of these products is missing, then you have the suspicion that maybe some data is missing, and you can try to estimate or just get more information about, about the product. Let's look at the cold balance. First, schematically to this uh, flowchart. On the left side, we have the supply, and we start from production. That uh, It's usually from surface or underground mines, but it can be also production of secondary products through transformation. Then we have trade and stock build and stock drawing. So it can be the stock change can be both positive or negative, not both at the same time, but either one or the other, depending on the year. On the right side, we have the, the demand with several uh, processes and flow. Transformation, we will see that later more in details, is when an energy product is transformed into another, into a secondary one. Then we have energy industry on use, that it's when a, a, a fuel is used to produce energy to support the operation of an energy industry process. Then we have total final consumption, that can be energy consumption and non-energy use. And finally, the losses, which are the distribution losses in the supply chain to move uh, in actually in the distribution and the transmission of a, of a process in the transport, let's say. Um, let's go 
to see some of these flows more in details and we look at production. Now, production can happen underground on uh, surface mines. There's also from other sources, which are specific cases that we can discuss maybe later on. Uh, but what is important about production, it's its definition. And it's the fact that in the amount reported in production, we have to uh, account for what is already the cleaned and washed and saleable product that it's then sold in the market and used in the various uses in industry and transformation and so on. So the removal of, for example, in inert matter or the cleaning, the amount that it's removed there, it's not included in the amount reported in production. As well, the amount consumed to support the production operation. So for example, in a mine, some of the coal can be used to produce heat to heat the some uh, some buildings or to just power the, the processes. That amount is accounted on the, on the demand side. So it would be reported on the demand side. And therefore we have to report it also in, uh, in production. Then we move to, to trade and indeed coal is a very tradable product, can be shipped over long distances or transported uh, via trains. And in terms of trade, it's very important, the definition of imports and export, with imports being the amount of coal which is which enter a country for being used domestically, whereas exports is the amount of coal which has been produced domestically and then leaves the country. And for both imports and exports, it's important to report in terms of uh, the origin country of the coal and the final destination of use of the coal for export. This means that transit trade is excluded. And you see here three scenarios. Uh, a is fairly simple, so I won't focus on this. I will briefly talk about B, which can be a okay scenarios. We have just to compare the production quantities with the export quantities and be sure that production is higher than export so that we know generally that all the exported quantities come from produced coal. Whereas in country C, we see in this example that we have no production, but we have imports and exports. So this is most probably transit trade. It should be excluded, but there can be a particular situation where coal is imported, then it's upgraded, then it's exported, then in a different form, or the export can come from stock change accumulated in previous years. So there are all these different situation and we invite you to contact us, for example, and to discuss uh, what is the most appropriate reporting of these uh, quantities. So here you see a list of uh, several transformation processes in uh, which are uh, collected in the cold questionnaire, many of them. We have the most important ones, probably, which is the transformation of coal into electricity and heat. But then we have also transformation of primary or sometimes secondary coals in other uh, secondary coal products, solid and, uh, and gaseous. And finally, we have in coal liquefaction plants, the transformation from solid fossil fuels to liquid fossil fuel. Let's see a very important example of transformation, which is the process of carbonization of cooking coal into a high temperature and oxygen free atmosphere in cocoa ovens. And the uh, result, the main outcome is cocoa cook oven cook. But then we have also some other byproducts, which are cook oven gas and coal tar. Now, it's very important in this process to have uh, to, to collect the data on all the, the products, inputs and outputs involved, and to verify, to validate this data, calculating the efficiency, which is generally in the range between 70 and 90%. And now to calculate it, you have to divide the output by the input, which is cooking coal, and sometimes other products uh, which enter the cook oven vessel and participate to the transformation process as well. And all of them have to be in energy units. That's very important in net energy units, actually. So let's zoom out quickly, and we look at the general picture of the iron and steel sector, because it's a very relevant one, which involves several process on the demand side of the coal balance, and it's important to classify them correctly. So we have transformation that happens, for example, in cocoa ovens. We saw that before, blast furnace, when an energy product is transformed into another. 
Then we have industry on use, which is one product is consumed to support the operation of the energy sector. That happens often in both in cocovens and the blast furnaces, when some of the gases are recirculated and put within the vessel in order to be burned and to provide heat to the whole uh, transformation, to the whole process. And then we have final consumption, which includes the use of energy products to provide energy again, but for more downstream processes in the iron and steel industry, where generally energy products are not involved. Again, a scheme uh, very useful because now you have arrows with colors that show you what are the transformation processes, the, tra the products involved into transformation, the one involved into energy industry and use, the energy products and the non-energy products which do not pertain the domain of energy statistics. But for the sake of time, uh, I will go fast here and then you can uh, read it at home later on. Okay, let's move to data reporting and to the final part of our presentation. So in terms of data collection, you already saw that there are several sources of data, so I won't be very long in this either, but you see that there are many parties that uh, could um, fill surveys also for their own uh, purposes, mining companies and enterprises to have uh, all the accounting of their operation, households and, uh, and so on. But then there are administrative data, which are always a very important source of, uh, of data and uh, energy the regulators are always very keen to indeed collect the, the most important, the latest, the most accurate data, for example, to check the implementation of a given policies uh, or program. Then in the case of direct measurements or coal, we have the measurement of calorific values, very important. Coal association in the case of other sources. And then we saw that for estimation and modeling, we have all this interconnection between products that can help us to estimate one or the other if one is missing. In this example, we have pig iron, which actually is a non-energy product, but whose production is directly correlated generally with blast furnace gas production. Moving to the questionnaire that again, we collect with, the, with our partner countries. And I know some of you are already familiar with that, but let's repeat it quickly. We have four main tables. The flow one, which basically it's a commodity balance of supply and demand for each coal product for a selected year, import and export table, and then the calorific table. We will see them in detail one by one later on. And then we have 17 product sheets, as it happens for um, other questionnaires, where you have all the flows um, for one given product, so for each product, in an install, and then you have the historical time series from 1990 onwards. Looking at uh, uh, here, the flow table, similarly to other questionnaire, you have in the column dimension the product, and in the horizontal dimension, the, the uses of, uh, of, a given, uh, of a given product. And again, going from top to bottom, you have supply, transformation, energy industry and use, and finally, you have final energy consumption. And yellow cells is where um, there was a change compared to the prefilled questionnaire. I think you already know that as well from previous presentation, but it's again, um, very useful, for example, to spot revision for, uh, older years. Then you have the imports and export tables. I want to zoom here. This is imports, export. And I want to zoom just to show you that there is a not elsewhere specified uh, line in both tables. And this is very important for uh, the case where you don't know exactly where this call come from or where it's directed. And you can input the amounts that you don't know um, the, the, the origin or destination here. Calorific value, very important. I also here, it's a bit small and I also wanna make it bigger here so you can see. Um, it's very important, you have it by product, but most importantly, you have it by flow. Okay, so I, I had to zoom out for the laser pointer, but you see that there are different flows and this is because indeed the calorific value of different quantities will most likely differ. The, the calorific value of an amount domestically produced will be very likely different of uh, an amount, the calorific value of an amount of coal imported, so produced in another country, as well as uh, we saw that it's a very heterogeneous product. So here you have the weighted average, 
but then you have some quantities used in industry that might be of a higher calorific value than other use in other uses, for example. So it's really important for the balance to report the correct calorific value by flow. And uh, uh, finally, this is the example of the final product to work, uh, product sheet. So this is for other bituminous coal. And you see that basically you have all the four tables, one after the other, if you scroll down. So you have first the accounting of flow, import and export, and calorific value. Uh, remarks page, to conclude, very important to provide additional information from you to us, because obviously you know better about the specific situation that applies to your country. And in the menu sheet, you see that on the top left, you have this check data button, then you select the year. And it's uh, really important because it can show you some easy consistency, consistency and arithmetic errors between tables. Finally, in conclusion, consistency is very important, uh, both within the questionnaire and between the different questionnaires. So within the questionnaire, we have the checks that I showed you before, uh, in just in the previous slide, some arithmetic checks, but it's also very important that you double check the efficiency of the processes between the different uh, table of the products to see, for example, that the efficiency of Cocoven or any other transformation process is not above 100%. And between questionnaire, it's very important to maintain consistency, for example, with the electricity questionnaire. So the same quantity of coal used in uh, electricity conversion has to be reported in coal and in electricity. Finally, you saw about the many tools that we have available, the manual, our international references, and so on, and the fact that our data, the data that we produce at EDC, are used in many other reports in the agency, and we have also many free products available for you. So thank you very much, and I'm ready for your questions.